Welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast, featuring interviews that take us deeper into the people and happenings on the local scene. For more podcasts and a closer look at what's going on in the Valley, visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Hi, my name is Dave Eisenstatter. I am the editor of the Valley Advocate. Welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast, a collaboration with Amherst Media. I'm here with Arts and Culture Editor Gina Beavers. Yes, and we are here with Liz O'Gilvie, who is the president of the Springfield Food Policy Council. Chair of the Chair Steering of Committee of the, of the, of the <laughs> Springfield Food Policy Council. President so of the close. world <laughs> and the gardening in the community yes. as well. I'm actually the president of, of the, the leaders of oh, the leaders free world. Of the free world. Yeah. And you got was, that shirt. To, to yeah, show this is them. a real organization that, which I am not affiliated with, ah. but I love. So. <laughs> close enough. I was so close. You so were very close. close. And I also chair the board of Gardening the Community. Yes. Which is a really amazing, amazing, amazing youth development urban farming organization in Springfield. Awesome. Yeah. Can you, I mean, I know a little bit about this um, work, and, and it's so awesome um, that this even exists in the world. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, working with the kids like you do, uh, uh, showing them uh, gardening and stuff, and kind of how uh, you got that developed so it was like a real... So I did not start Gardening the Community. The young woman who started this organization, mm -hmm. um, her name is Ruby Maddox. This is new, our new project, but she started Gardening the Community like 20 years ago, and she was a baby herself, with no major vision, just sort of as a reaction to the fact that she wanted kids to learn how to grow food. Mm -hmm. um, and I live in Mason Square. We, you know, I've talked about this. People who know me have heard me say there are 10 McDonald's. Dave, you've heard me yeah. say this within a mile and three quarter of my house and very little access to fresh produce. Mm. And gardening the community was really the front end of urban agriculture in Springfield, which is not a new thing. You know, anybody of a particular age can talk about their grandmothers having gardens. Sure. And, but now there's a lot of intentionality attached to it because we can't get access to food in the way that folks up here in the upper valley. Yeah the upper happy valley um, mm. the have access curtain. to. So at Guarding the Community, we uh, develop young people to do everything from soil testing to amending and working the soil to planting the seeds, growing the food, harvesting the food. We sell it through a couple of different mediums. We have a CSA, a community share of agriculture, and so we have families who make a commitment in there across the sliding scale. Most of them are lower income folks who use their SNAP benefits mm -hmm. to buy a fresh share of organic produce. I mean, that's really important because we have so little sources for it in Springfield. And for us, it's not really a, maybe the, I don't want to diminish people who live up here because I have a number of friends in the Upper Valley, but it's not an intellectual pursuit. You know, we right. have kids who have been diagnosed with all sorts of the DDDs and the ADDs, and there are clear links between pesticides and uh, the pesticides that are being used to like even bring the food to harvest, like Roundup. You know, yeah. farmers are spraying their wheat with, with Roundup, and we wonder why kids are sick. Mm -hmm. And so, we sell through our CSA. We sell through their GTC has their own farm stands, and we recently purchased some land, so we will have a permanent farm stand that's sort of a mini Atkins farm that I'm incredibly proud of. That's um, really cool. that, and that's it's new. In that's the heart new? of the neighborhood. Yeah. That's when the farm that? stand will open this spring. That's oh, that's so um, cool. Is there, a, is there a date certain? Is there, there is a, not a date okay. certain. We'll it make, is construction. We'll so, make sure you yes. but we will the be date. there. Yeah, and yeah. it may not be in its completely finished state because we're still raising money. We have about $52,000 we need to raise. But we intend to open. The community has been waiting for a very long time. There's a lot of physical development happening in Springfield, not so much happening in our neighborhood. Yeah. And when it is happening, it's dollar stores. And so mm, yes. this, yeah. people have really globbed onto this. And folks who live in other neighborhoods in Springfield who drive through Mason Square, you know, I get text messages. When is it opening? I'm tired of driving up the hill mm -hmm. for my food. So yeah. it's a pretty amazing thing um, that we built. And these young people are growing up. The young people that recruited me to gardening the community, I was just a mom with a new baby sitting in my house wondering if coming back to Springfield is the right move. And because I had this baby and I had visions of making my own baby food and, you know, I couldn't buy an apple in my neighborhood, mm, never right. mind yeah. anything else that was fresh. And they were just taking a survey, this was eight years ago, asking me where did I buy my food and what did I think about the fact that we didn't have access to food. I was an organizer and I'd come here from Chicago. Springfield is my home and all of a sudden I thought, there is stuff happening here and now 
all these many years later, you know, I'm chair of the board and we own land and GTC has been this doorway that I've walked into the food system world. Um, Urban Ag is just one small piece of it. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's one grand piece of it. Um, but when you think about the whole food system, it's production, it's school food, it's grocery stores, and Springfield had real deficits in all of those areas, so I've been chewing on them, if you will, for the last several years, and we are making progress in some areas. Yeah, and so I'm what's one of your greatest accomplishments? Others. I know that in the, uh, school food I'm really yeah, excited about. That's really mm -hmm. um, and it's not my greatest accomplishment. This has really been an amazing thing that our city has done together from parents, school nurses, the Sodexo, who was sort of the empire, you mm -hmm. know, one of those empires mm -hmm. amongst food service, has shown up. And that, that's the school that's lunch the providers. That's the school lunch yes. provider. Um, and Springfield Public Schools have made incredible investment and an incredible commitment to our kids. For low-income families, school food is core food for them. Mm. You know, it's yeah. two meals a day. And Absolutely. when I talk about um, Hamden County has the high, lowest county health rankings in the entire state. Mm -hmm. So in Massachusetts, the top 50% are doing really well. Right. The other half of us are not doing so well. Springfield has the highest obesity, the highest childhood obesity rates, the highest hypertension rates. Mm -hmm. um, these are things that kill people. Mm -hmm. And they're preventable because they're food related. And you know, I think when we met and talked about the grocery store, Dave, I talked about the fact that I grew up thinking that I was predestined to have high blood pressure and cardiac disease because I was black. Because right. you hear that. You hear the, that so messaging. The, like, statistically. Yes, yeah. just, but um, it's not because I'm black. Right. It's because of the condition of the neighborhood I mm, live in. Yeah. And so for people of color, African Americans, um, Latinos, and, you know, I'm remiss. I generally will not talk about food without talking about race. Yeah. And you can't talk about food without talking about land. Yep. So I need to acknowledge that we're like sitting on land that was another people's land. Um, and no disrespect intended, but you know, Northampton was not always Northampton. Mm -hmm. There were people, the Nanatuck people were here for thousands of yes. years before the pioneers, if you will. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, I'm a descendant of stolen people. And so so the conditions that we're experiencing in Springfield are the result of being born out of a mm -hmm. broken system. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our human agriculture, I mean, well, it's not human agriculture, but agriculture is based on the idea of free labor and cheap labor. And we still have that kind of production system. There are people living in Springfield who work on these organic farms up in the valley right. and they can't afford to, to buy mm, the food. To buy the food. To, to feed their kids. Pitch. And that leads to all the disease stuff I was talking about. So GTC, as it's grown over the years, you know, initially it was teach kids about the soil, teach them about growing, and you can begin to talk to them about healthy food. Right. And and now it's the heart of the urban ag movement in Springfield. For me, coming in through that door, I didn't for years grow anything when I worked at GTC, and I was starting to feel pretty inauthentic about it. I did a lot of hard work, but I wasn't touching the soil because mm -hmm. black folks have a very ambivalent relationship, Absolutely. you know? Yeah. And we, but I've come to understand that my trauma happened on the soil, not right. in the soil. Hmm. And in the soil there can be great healing. But the journey to that, I started volunteering in the school garden because it was a great way to learn how to grow without adding myself to the GTC <laughs> kids who were teenagers who had been knowing me for years and assumed I knew everything about growing. <laughs> and that broke me wide wow. open because yeah. little kids, you know, I met little kids who had never had a cherry tomato. Right. And I have an eight-year-old. Um, and I was spending a lot of time in schools looking at the food and it was deplorable. So I started to try to figure out why, and I started working with Sodexo and Springfield Public Schools, and they were responsive. Um, and so three or four years later, we have a salad bar in every single school after the point of sale, which means every kid gets to eat as much salad as they want. Kids get a fresh produce snack, fruit and or vegetables twice a week. Mm -hmm. um, our biggest accomplishment has been breakfast in the classroom after the bell which means every Everybody single kid is. has breakfast in the morning. Late. You, yeah. you can't right. be too late for right. that. Yeah. Um, and our city uh, fell under community eligibility provision, which you know was hard for the city to go after because it told the story of poverty at the same time that we were trying to sell a story of resurgence, resurgence. around the casino. And But they understood uh, that yeah. getting that kind of eligibility reduced barriers around free lunch and free breakfast. Like the paperwork is daunting, like every other no, piece of imagine. paperwork that poor people have to go through 
to get access to things that everybody should have. Like every kid should have breakfast in the morning. There's yeah. no way you can expect them to have a good day at school and perform well if they're it's hungry. To learn, to have um, to and to and Sodexo now gets it, and Springfield Public Schools gets it. When we have snow days, I have talked to the food service director and the after we had those crazy weeks of cold mm -hmm. then we had that uh, snow yeah. we had a snow day on a Thursday and I was talking to him on Thursday morning and he said Liz kids aren't going to eat today and then we mm. had and, and I knew that because we had had days and days of cold and we have a lot of old houses in Frankville people have oil furnaces yeah. and you run out of oil and yeah. you have mm. to make a choice do I yeah. buy food or do I keep them warm and you can lose your kids if you lose your heat. Yes. DCF comes to your house and you don't have heat. They don't help you pay your bill. They take your children. So families make those kinds of decisions. And, you know, the food service director is saying, we've got to figure out how to get food kids, kids, food to kids on snow days because we had another snow day on that Friday, which meant that there might be kids who hadn't mm -hmm. had a meal until they came back to school on Monday. On Monday. Right. Um, the only reason I agreed to do this podcast is because I want people in the Upper Valley to think about that when they put their kids to bed at night. Mm. I want them to imagine what it would be like to make a decision, do I buy rice because it's filling, even though my kid is asking me for a clementine or asking me for a salad because I've taught them right. in the school gardens that that's what they should eat and that's what's good for them. Um, but if you've got a stretch, and it's winter and heating costs have been higher this season mm -hmm. and not everybody gets fuel assistance and when you get it it's not enough so families are forced to compromise and make these choices and I, I mean I didn't grow up with anything so I knew that um, but my husband's a teacher I have a little bit more privilege than most of my neighbors and as I started to cobble all this together I began to see that GTC as magnificent as it is is just a drop in the bucket so we've got to work on all this other food system stuff so the school food has been, it keeps me warm at night knowing that mm. during the week yeah. they're getting better food. I want better and I want more and the school district has made an crazy uh, investment, the school district and the city, um, and they're building a culinary nutrition center which will allow them to like bake their own muffins. Mm. So not only will they continue to get breakfast, as long as, God forbid, we don't have huge snap cuts mm -hmm. out of the yeah. farm bill. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. do, do you have, do you have a, a, a vision for your neighborhood for the Mason Square neighborhood for you know right now it's you said 10 McDonald's I have a vision a for half. Springfield uh, because right, or it's the not whole just city. my neighborhood yeah right you know? well yeah I was gonna yeah. I have a vision that the default will be fresh food it mm -hmm. won't be McDonald's you know I have the benefit of having worked at the Public Health Institute of Western Mass formerly known as Partners for a Healthier Community and I learned about health disparities there I learned about um, how we can change long-term health outcomes and that really fired me up about school food because it was a place I could have we could have immediate impact right. it takes a long time to build a grocery store mm -hmm. it takes a long time to grow enough food to feed an entire city but my vision is that we won't be two cities we won't be downtown and then the rest of Springfield right. my vision is that we will have department heads and our city government that live in our communities and so when we're making planning decisions and someone is coming and saying I want to develop this piece of property in Mason Square or the South End or the North End um, the default isn't a family dollar the default is a fresh produce right. stand. That was just an issue right with uh, with Mayor Sarno talking about uh, you know I, I don't give a damn about skin yeah, color or something doesn't. and 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 how uh, uh, I think it was. He said, I don't give a damn about race. The city yeah. council sent him a letter saying, why are all that? We're a majority people of color city. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to give numbers. I think the city council said 70%. Um, my that's response big. to that is, I think it's greater than that. Either that means yeah. that the white people we have are all old, and right. they're not send, or they're white people who are not sending their kids to public, public school. Because yeah. right. if you look at the school data, we look much more like we're 85% people of right. color. And yet, with the exception of health and human services, all of the department heads are white. Right. Yes. And so this right. is not about like kick them out, but there have been some recent hires. So it's so layered, like I'm dug in on food, but I also understand that if you don't see someone who looks like yourself in a job, you can't imagine yourself in that job. In that job. There are people in my family were not college educated, but when I was a little girl and we lived here, my mother would drive me up to Smith and Mount Holyoke and I'm gonna cry because she was a young single mother at the time 
and point for the few, so this is the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, and she would point out brown students on campus and say, that could be you. Yeah. So I got that fire in me, mm. but, you know, and at that time we had a few teachers of color. We had a librarian in the Mason Square Library who was a black woman who also reinforced that. Mm -hmm. And she would give me, you know, amazing books to read. But we're in a different place now. There are schools in Springfield that are, you know, 95% kids of color and their teachers are all white. Right. And some, like at my son's schools, are amazing teachers who drive from Cummington and Conway because they want to teach in a diverse district. They know it's good for them. They know it's good for kids. And they live in Conway or Cummington because they want to have chickens, not because they don't mm -hmm. want to live next door to black people or Latinos. We unfortunately have people who are saying, I care about the city and I want to be the chief of police. But they don't live here. But they don't live here. And the message is, how can you want to protect me? How can you want to keep me safe? But you don't want to be my neighbor. Yeah, you don't. And what? And so if I get that as an adult, what does that say to children? And if you don't see when we're watching the city council meetings and folks are getting up, the you know the whatever the department head is, because they're some of them are very fine people, so I don't want to pick on departments. Um, and I don't want them to get fired so other people can get jobs. But no. when there are openings, be proactive. Yeah. Because there are brilliant young people of Latino descent and Asian descent and. African American, Black, Caribbean, however we identify yourself, who bring a richness to the work. Mm -hmm. And because if you've grown up in the neighborhood, you're thinking about development in the neighborhood quite differently than when you drive by. Mm -hmm. When I started talking about fresh produce, and oftentimes even with GTC, people will say, oh, well, Puerto Ricans don't eat salad. Uh -huh. Or I had a white garden teacher ask me once, how are we going to get the kids to eat collards? And uh -huh. I said, do you mean collard greens? And she said, yes. And she said, my kids won't eat collards. And I said, if you're saying like that, they probably don't know what you're talking about. But, <laughs> you know, Martha Stewart didn't invent collards. Mm. Right. Like, they came from the South. Black people have eaten collard greens their whole lives. Maybe we need to present them in a way that is familiar, mm -hmm. maybe slightly healthier than the three days of cooking that some people in my family put them through with lots mm -hmm. of salt pork, <laughs> but still in a way that tastes good, right? <laughs> I'm just being real. Like, yeah. Um, but the idea that we don't want produce when, like, who do people think taught people how to grow all of this stuff? Mm -hmm. We talk about, um, you know, as some of us do, not everybody, but the fact that our economy was built on slavery, the trade mm -hmm. of people and agriculture. And people will say it's built on the labor of black people and built on the blacks of black people. but. It wasn't just that. My ma married name is Ogilvy. My maiden name was Wills. Those were plantations. Right. My husband's father is Jamaican, and his people came off of a sugar plantation. Right. My dad's people came off of a plantation owned by an English person. Do you really think they knew how to grow stuff in the heat? Right. So the Africans who were stolen and brought here, you know, it, it was our brain trust. It wasn't just our sheer labor. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we, I, I'm rich in the idea of vegetables. When I was in college, my grandmother in Alabama, my father's mother, my stepfather's mother, who's my dad, um, would send me canned stuff. And I'd be like, Nana, you know, it cost you $52 to send me these green beans. <laughs> this is in the 80s. I appreciate it. But she wanted me to eat well. And so, yes. so we, have, uh, we have so many things we need to talk about and help people to understand. And there are amazing people across the valley, many of them who are white, who are saying these same things and working with us. But it's also important for folks to understand people in Springfield, regardless of race, are not waiting to be saved. We're doing no. it. And we're not gonna like the black women in Alabama. We are not just saving ourselves. Those black women saved that state and saved all the rest of us from our friend Roy. For Fred, mm -hmm. friend you know, Roy Moore. And, Moore. Yes. Um, black Panther. And we're all yes. very grateful. We're all, yeah, very we're grateful. all very grateful. But you know, it didn't surprise me. Black women been holding up the world forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Gina and I were talking about Black Panther opening. Mm. And you know, it and really is. A, it? Well, of course, not on opening night. But <laughs> be, I mean, it's a visually amazing, right? We don't mm -hmm. get to see ourselves depicted as people running something depicted as people with wealth, mm -hmm. depicted as people with love for each other and love for their land and love, you know, even for other people's lands. And so and my husband is a huge comic book fan. He was okay. a comic book <laughs> kid, right? But it's clearly so much more than that. I've been listening to the interviews and, you know, it's a great opportunity for teachers and parents to talk to their kids about media representation mm -hmm. of people of color 
because we don't get to see ourselves in that way. And, um, but I was talking to someone about taking some kids and this person said, oh, well, we have superheroes in this work all the time. And I know I am, I'm one. Mm. Like, and there yes. are many in my community, everyday people, the people who choose to take a risk and make an investment. Poor people decide I'm gonna spend this much money and come buy produce because it's good for me, but I also believe in gardening the community. Or when Liz says, go with me to the state house so we can advocate for breakfast in the classroom, you know, English might not be my first language, but I'm going because I want my kids and I want every other kid in this school to have access to good food. And mm -hmm. so I could go on for like two days. Well, I, I mean, I, I thank you so I much know. for your work. So if people want to make a difference, if we want to be superheroes, where do we go? You can start in a couple of places. So we have to build muscle for this work, right? I talk about yoga when I'm talking to people in big settings about how talking about race is difficult and we have to build our muscles for it. But everybody up here does yoga. And yoga <laughs> is, you know, like I'm oftentimes talking to mostly white women because I don't know why it's harder for men to come and dig in in these places because mm -hmm. it's painful and mm -hmm. men have to build the muscle mm -hmm. a little takes them a little bit longer. No, mm -hmm. not you, you're very precious. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so we've got to build a muscle for talking about it, but we've got to think about our purchases. When you're going into River Valley, and I shop there sometimes, I can't buy very much, I always come out with very small bags, mm -hmm. but don't buy Driscoll's strawberries. Berries are picked by hand. And a corporation is intent upon getting the most berries to market. So you have berry farms in California. First of all, my eight-year-old knows we should not be eating berries right now because mm. they're coming on a truck from far away. And probably the conditions of the people who pick those berries are not good. I've seen videos of berry farms in California where I lived, so I know what the wildfires are like. You can see the smoke in the background and the farm workers have bandanas tied on their faces to prevent smoke inhalation. And they're still picking berries. Mm -hmm. Anybody seeing this who had a berry in the day before, or got some berries in their fridge, eat them, you spent money on them. Don't buy any more. Get used to buying strawberries from farmers here who need to sell every berry they have and pay what they're worth. And know even when you're paying what those berries cost, that difference is not getting to the farm worker. So that's a small thing. And then when you wanna take a bigger leap, look at the people who are picking who are growing the food here. And be aware that they're probably not eating the food that they're growing. And if you have been silent on the DACA conversation or the Dreamer conversation, get unsilent. I went to school in Boston for grad school. I worked as a nanny. Most of my friends were Irish nannies. Most of them had come on visitor's visas and they just never left. Just and a few I'm still in touch with and their husbands are fire chiefs or they own construction companies and they were nice young Irish boys who also came on visitors visas and nobody is asking them if they're legal and documented. So I am challenging every person of European descent to ask a question about how you came to be here. And if it was pre the 20s when immigration law was put in place by men with white skin, ask yourself if it's fair that we're now having this conversation and having it in an unjust and an inhumane way. That's way at one end. In the middle, <laughs> you can support the work of people. I don't get paid, you know. Yeah. Um, our staff at Gardening the Community does, but not enough. People need to be paid a living wage to do really hard work. So support organizations like Gardening the Community, support farms like Next Barn Over that supports Gardening the Community. Pay attention to the farms that are listed at River Valley or whatever market you shop at. Find out about their practices. Find out if they're paying living wages to their employees. Support the Springfield Food Policy Council. Come to events. Be thoughtful about where you write your checks to at the end of the year, when you, or the middle of the year, or the beginning of the year when you're making donations. Or go volunteer. Start asking questions at your kid's school when they're coming home and talking about a history segment. Mm -hmm. And find out, are you teaching kids about who used to be here? Do we even know? And the other thing is, there are indigenous people living here right now. Mm -hmm. Are they identified? Do they get asked? Do children get asked if they have? So there's lots of places that people can dig in and and anybody can call me up. I'm easy to find. Yay. Yeah. Um, I and do. I will help yeah, them. I've, I've got so your call number. you guys. <laughs> yeah, Don't give my number out no, to everybody. I, oh, <laughs> that's gotta go but on the screen. And, and the <laughs> thing is, you know, so I'm like one person, but there are lots of us all over Springfield, yes. all over Holyoke, 
all over the valley, and it's not just people of color who are hungry. My friends up in the hill towns, it was mm. mind-boggling to me that little white kids who live in rural towns, they don't have access to grocery store any more than we do, and they don't have a bus to get there. So I've got friends in Orange and Athol who, um, there's a woman, Deb Habib, and the name of her organization is escaping me, but I don't care where you live in the valley, you can find a place where people do not have equal access to food and you can do something about it. You're the well, best. Yeah, thank you so much for coming in, Liz. <laughs> thank you. Really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Thank you.